Okay, hello everybody, good evening, and welcome to Falcor Live. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Deborah Smith. I'm a marine technician aboard the research vessel Falcor. Falcor is owned and operated by Schmidt Ocean Institute, and we're very happy to have you this evening with us. We are currently off the west coast of Australia, and I am joined with Dr. Narada Wilson and Dr. Lisa Kirkendale, and they are both going to tell you a little bit about the expedition we're currently on. So on Falcor, we use the sort of designation of FK 200308. That means we left on March 8th, 2020. So we've been out here for a few weeks and we have been utilizing the ROV Sebastian. We've been utilizing some landers and fish traps and they are here as part of the group from the Western Australia Museum. So I'm going to turn it over to them and they are going to explain a little bit about why they're here, what this expedition is all about, where all these samples are going that they're collecting, and a little bit about each other. So first, I'd like, Narada, can you introduce yourself and what, what you're doing and why you're here? Sure. So I'm Narada Wilson. I'm leading this expedition with a group of colleagues and friends, Western Australian Museum and a number of other institutions. And we're out here to try and understand the biodiversity that lives in the canyons off Western Australia. Really unexplored, and so we're pretty excited to be able to start in faces to names uh, and, and seeing those animals for the first time and recording them. Hi, my name is Dr. Lisa Kirkendale. I'm also from the Western Australia Museum. Very excited to be on board Falkor for a deep sea cruise. Um, a lot, as Nerida said, a lot of this coastline is quite unexplored. Um, we expect a lot of new discoveries and exciting finds. And we're doing this uh, with an amazing support staff. That's the Schmidt Ocean Institute and the Falkor team, as well as some colleagues from around the world. So poised for excellence in every way. Great. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So we're going to show you a little bit of video. And um, Lisa and Nerida are going to describe what's happening in this video. And I'm going to start that by sending it out to you guys and hitting play. So first, it's just showing you where in the world we are. This is the Midwest coast. And we're sitting at the moment literally on top of Cape Range Submarine Canyon. We've been doing dives along here for the last couple of weeks the ROV Sebastian about to enter the water for a dive and obviously the deeper the water it is the longer it takes to get to the bottom so we have to make some calculations um, and uh, and wait for uh, the exciting biodiversity to, to come to our eyes. And this is one of the most spectacular finds so far it's a giant hydroid so essentially a living flower with a single polyp um, and we found this at a couple of sites Thick siphonophores, beautiful stock glass sponges, and just this air of excitement and discovery. In the control room, we're watching these screens. We're using these tools. Here, this is a suction sampler. And we're looking very closely at those rock walls to find tiny animals and collect them. Them onto the, the boxes and, and sample holders on Sebastian and they come up at the end of the day uh, and we can and look at them more closely. Here's a wonderful squid, um, uh, shrimp swimming. And this is a sea cucumber being slurped up into the sub Sebastian. Beautiful black coral and, and the old an old stock of a um, glass sponge. And these are these glass fine glass spicules you're seeing up close a fantastic um, pelagic worm called squid worm and that's been captured in the and we're just looking. coral being collected it has a little basket star clinging to it here you see the front of the bio uh, the tray in front of Sebastian where we put all of those samples so we can choose to put it in a box or a quiver and and the pilots have amazing dexterity to be able to place those samples into they make it look really really easy but it's incredibly difficult even just taking a sediment sample here with a push core, you have to very carefully apply pressure in, in all the right directions and push that into the, the sediment end up with a, a sample full of grains that we can. One of the amazing things I think we're impressed with is um, the ROV's the ROV uh, team's ability to use the manipulator arms to carefully select individual specimens to pick off off up off the ocean bottom. This is a very 
careful and um, lovely way of just taking one thing at a time and only what we need from the seafloor. See uh, an amazing score. These are very difficult to capture, obviously. So we've come up with a technique of using a kitchen brush, just the kind you'd wash your dishes with. About, and the squid interacts with it. And then you can see here in close up some tiny smidges of and we're able to get DNA samples from them. It's a really uh, helpful way to, to sample animals that we can't actually collect it and take back with us. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for that awesome narration. I'm going to have both of you just wiggle the headset where it might meets your um, control box on your headphones real quick. Sorry guys for the technical difficulties. I can hear them kind of coming in and out a little bit. So just want to make sure the connections are good. Okay, so again, thank you everybody for joining us at home. I know that some of you are going to have some amazing questions for our science leaders here on Falcor. So go ahead and type in your questions. If anybody wants to see some more footage or ask some questions, I'm actually going to start the questions by saying to asking both of you, what's the most exciting thing you've seen so far on this expedition? Yeah. I, I think for me, uh, I seem to have a fairly short memory, so uh, every time we pick something up, I'm really <laughs> excited about it. And you might have seen that in one of the parts of the video. Um, so that moment of discovery is incredible for me. And every time we stop and take the time to pick up a sample, I think it's the most amazing sample that's ever been seen before. So uh, it's a constantly changing kaleidoscope of, of discoveries for me. Mm -hmm. I'm like laughing because it just reminds me of Dory from Finding Nemo. Um, <laughs> uh, I would have to say probably one of the highlights is that beautiful um, giant hydroid that you saw the close-up image of that looked like a beautiful pink flower. Um, that was spectacular and absolutely unexpected and to come across not just one but two and be able to kind of uh, film it and see it in its um, natural environment and behaving was stunning. Amazing. Okay, so other than um, Elizabeth Cook says hi on Facebook, and I think my niece and nephew um, and my sister have tuned in. Come on, guys, we need some questions. Um, let me ask you real quick, what is it like to work with an ROV from a scientist's perspective? Also, can you talk a little bit about why working with ROV Sebastian is so special to you guys here in Australia? Definitely. Um, in Australia, excuse me, we don't have um, access to a, a national ROV facility. So um, we're not able to explore the deep sea uh, simultaneously sort of using that imagery and selectively picking up specimens. So for us, when Falcor uh, comes to Australia and works with us to explore our environment, it's a totally unique opportunity. So um, it's just incredibly special to get the imagery of those animals in their environment um, naturally we can see the way that they attach we can see the way that they interact that's really important to understand their place in the environment so um, it's a really key piece of equipment and we're really uh, excited and grateful to be using one of the things I find amazing about Sebastian is how the ROV team utilizes it they help us solve problems about how to acquire animals that we might not have got the right, you know, brought the right equipment on board for. So they're absolutely innovators and they know their ROV very well. So they know how to attach a little fine brush that's essentially an eyelash that helps us kind of tickle a specimen off the wall. So yeah, it's incredible. Amazing. Okay, so we do have some questions rolling in. Our first question is, what has been the most impactful thing you've seen or done for the future? I think one of the things that's impressed me quite a bit is that we haven't seen a large amount of trash on the bottom of the sea. And we know from other surveys that the deep sea, although it seems very remote and pristine, it's often quite impacted. But because we don't visit it and look at it very often, we forget about it. Um, so far here on our dives, we've only seen two pieces of, of human influence. And so that's it's quite encouraging um, to us that some of the conservation measures that go on on shore with managing um, waste uh, in a very you know popular tourist area uh, seem to be working. 
I think um, maybe some of the most impactful moments for me have been just knowing that we're contributing slowly and a specimen by specimen to a better understanding of the world and this incredible part of the world. We know it's rich, um, we know it's remote, and we just need to understand the biodiversity so we can better conserve it. So we're just picking away at that big problem. And, and you may not realize, but um, this particular canyon is So it, it's wonderful that this biodiversity is protected. We don't know that much about what really lives there. I think connecting people they have invested in saving is really Great, thank you. So we have lots of questions rolling in. Um, I am going to read the next one. So how many people are on this expedition and what type of expertise is represented? So can you talk a little bit about the team that's here? I'm going to go ahead. I'll go. Um, I think there are ooh, 10 to 14 scientific staff, um, and they really represent experts in their respective fields. Um, Nerda and I are interested in mollusks, also other groups as well. Um, we have had an expert in worms and other invertebrates, Dr. Greg Rouse from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, Dr. Glenn Moore, who's an expert in fish, and he's the curator of fish at the Western Australia Museum. We have Andrew Hosey, who's our curator of crustacea and worms at the Western Australia Museum. We've had Rachel Preslowski, Dr. Rachel Preslowski from Geoscience Australia on board to help us with the sediment samples and understand some of the geology of the area. Nerida, who else is on our expedition? Georgia Nestor, who's here doing um, part of her PhD work on environmental. So her component is to water samples where we're doing our surveys, looking in that water for to match that up with the animals that we uh, a better understanding of whether we're missing much of the biodiversity. So just trying to understand how effective the um, We've also got uh, David, who's another student, David Jerskovich, um, also from Curtin University, and he's um, paired up with uh, Janelle Ritchie, who, and both of them are working on marine invertebrate zoology, so augmenting the collections of the Western Australian Museum, taxa such as sponges, corals, um, brachiopods, bryozoan, or moss animals, as well as echinoderms. Um, we've been very lucky to have uh, Liam Cook, who's been on board for the first leg, and he's a student from Geraldton Senior High School as part of the Follow the Dream problem, uh, program there, and um, it was, it's been amazing having him on board. He instantly bonded with the ROV team and really got um, in to kind of help uh, launch the Sebastian as well as recover it, help with some data entry and a few other tasks. But that, that's been really meaningful. The helping hands of this expedition and stayed on to help ours for which we're... Okay, awesome. Guys, I'm going to pause real quick because I'm going to switch Nerida's headset because she keeps coming in and out and we want to be able to hear the amazing things that she um, is talking about. So I'm going to field the next question to Lisa while I fix Nerida's headset. Um, and let's see, uh, what is the most rare organism you've found so far? Do we know if we know that? <laughs> That's from my dad, so I can um, yell at him later. <laughs> the most <laughs> rare <laughs> organism. <laughs> Let's see, we're certainly on the lookout for one, but I'll let Nerida address that later. Uh, the probably, fish. Yeah, some of the fish, actually. So, fish are very, very well known around the world, and that's true also in Western Australia. And so shallow coastal records of our marine fish fauna um, from Kimberley through the mid coast, often in Galoo, as well as down south, um, are just very well documented and understood. So I think Glenn has been tremendously excited um, with some of the fish he's been finding in the deep sea, which is one of the few areas where the fish fauna is not well known. Um, so I can't name exactly one fish that he's most excited about, but I know there's a cusk eel there that is um, tickled his fancy and some others as well. So probably some of the 
pesky fish, and you're seeing the cuscule here, here in view right now, swimming along. Oh, a bony-eared donkey fish. Luckily, I'm not the fish curator, and I'll just stick to mollusks. It's, it's one of the challenges when we're doing this kind of work um, that, you know, we come across animals we haven't seen before and, you know, we need to take those back to the lab and look at them more closely to understand them. So, so we're constantly seeing things that we don't know and that can be fun and challenging and tricky to narrate at the time as we're seeing it. We're like, oh, we think this is a thing. Looking at it more closely going, hmm. Not too sure, actually. Mm. So you kind of get to come along that, uh, that journey of discovery with us. Absolutely. And so we definitely use the term field identifications when we're in the field, and then we'll kind of confirm those identifications back in the lab. Absolutely. Okay, so since we're still talking about specimens, there's a couple of questions. And then I, well, for all of you waiting to hear about how people get into this and what we're going to do next, I'm going to do that section next. But what will you be doing with the specimens you've collected once the cruise ends? So I know this was something we were talking about earlier. Where are all of these things going, these animals, these sediments, all of this different type of samples going when you guys get off of Falcor? Yeah, so the specimens themselves will be coming back to the Western Australia Museum. So we're taking them back off of the boat, carefully shipping them um, back to Perth, where they'll reside in our wet collections primarily. So that's a spirit collection um, that's kept that, and these animals are kept in alcohol at our Harry Butler Research Center. Um, we're very proud of the new facility. It's got incredible capacity um, for housing these samples into the future. Um, they'll be finalized and databased and that data once it's um, cleaned up and checked will go up onto the Atlas of Living Australia and so that's a portal that's available to the world so it's publicly accessible data. Um, specimens have had tissues sampled on board and those tissues might be used for genetic analysis um, or anatomical or histological um, work. Um, the other thing that's really important is, well, we have the beautiful 4K footage and videos that Falkor and Sebastian has taken. We'll get that imagery to pair with our own images. So once the animals come on board here, we're actually taking careful um, pictures of different features that are really important to capture that may be um, lost, such as color patterns once the animals are preserved in alcohol. Um, so yeah, so the specimens are coming back to Western Australia Museum, but then a lot of them are actually going to head out again. So we're going to share the collection with um, international scientists all over the world who are experts in other groups um, that we've captured on the cruise. Wow, that sounds amazing. Lots of work to be had. I'm sure it's going to take years to finally get everything processed. Um, so that's amazing. And I'm sure that we'll get updated at some point in the future on where all of this is going and maybe see you guys back on Falcor. Um, there have been a lot of questions about sort of what advice do you have for people who want to work at sea in science or robotics? How is math important to working on a boat and doing research? Um, my daughter wants to be a marine biologist. That's from Michael Rogers. So can you guys talk a little bit about what and how you got into this field, your recommendations to younger kids and younger adults on potentially becoming ocean explorers? Sure. Um, I think the interesting piece of advice that I have for people if they want to go into science is to become the best writer that you can be. It seems quite um, like not the advice you expect. Um, I'm going to assume that if you want to be a scientist, you already are probably doing pretty well in your science subjects, so that's great. Um, maths and statistics are incredibly important, and it's easy. The sooner you get a grasp on that, the easier your life will be. But one of the key parts to being a scientist is communicating your results. And so we do that by writing papers that we publish in, in scientific journals and that other scientists read and kind of critique. Um, and so being able to communicate that those results effectively is one of your, honestly, it's like the most dominant activity you'll ever do as a scientist. There'll be lots of thinking and all of that, but it doesn't matter unless you can actually tell people about it. So um, having a good vocabulary, being good at spelling, being good at English are all really, really important. But of course, you know, uh, math is, is really important and, and these you don't realise at the time that they are and it's only much later you look back and you think, 
or we should have maybe well. concentrated a bit more. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, but the wonderful thing about science is that it's so broad. And so um, you, as you sort of go down your path, you'll find different things that interest you more and some less. Main thing is just to stay really open because you don't know things that I do now, um, such as genetics and, and, and looking at biogeographic patterns, things that I actually studied. So it doesn't need to limit you, but I think staying open and curious and honestly working hard. Yes, working hard is what working all hard. scientists do. I was that would be that would have been my piece of advice, and there it is. Yeah, said it is hard work. So. Um, really good work ethic and establishing that in whatever discipline you're interested in now will fare you in good stead for later on when you say you might switch fields or something like that. Just hard work. Yeah. <laughs> Find what you love, do it well, <laughs> do a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, so we don't probably can't speak too much for people who want to get involved in the engineering side, but I think the general... Sorry, everybody, for the in and out communication. As you know, technology is one of those important things to learn as with science. Um, it Ooh, takes that's a... Deb. <laughs> that's Deb. <laughs> it takes a village. Um, yeah, so I would say in terms of math, you know, one of the things on this expedition that we've been doing is deploying landers and fish traps. And the ROV team have been a great help in this um, because they've actually been doing a lot of the math of how much weight do you have to put on these landers and these fish traps to make them sink and then actually how then we drop that weight and leave the weight behind so these steel plates up behind on the seafloor and we have this acoustic release that we send out a ping to and it triggers it and then it lets the whole device float back up to the surface so you have to calculate how buoyant this entire large structure is just floating around in the water by itself how much weight to add to make it to sink to the seafloor, but not too fast, so it sticks into the mud and never comes back, and how much of that weight to release so that it floats back up to the surface. So math does come in to being really important in some of the technology ends of things, you know, whether it's the really complicated part of the ROV or as simple as trying to figure out how much weight and buoyancy something you're trying to sink to the seafloor takes. Um, so our next question, let's see, what else do we have? Um, have you collected any hydroids that produce hydromedusa, medusae? Oh, my pronunciation. Sorry if I did that wrong. I think we probably have. We uh, haven't um, got too many hydroids. We've seen some in the polyp stage, certainly. Probably one of the most spectacular kind of smaller hydroids we've seen was the one that kind of covered this, what we call a shaggy dog <laughs> sea cucumber. It was just completely this intricate network enmeshed of hydroids covering um, a sh the shaggy sea cucumber. Um, yeah, at Nerida, I think we've collected about five or so uh, groups of hydroids um, and maybe a couple hydromedusae yeah. at that different stage of the hydroid life cycle. We. Um, Seen a few jellies, so scyphozones or true jellies. Um, what else have we seen? And the Nidarian, beautiful siphonophores in the water column. And yeah. obviously, playing in the background right now is our enormous hydroid polyp. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know if it's been widely published yet, but we did see that incredibly large siphonophore on the way up. So one yes. of the things that's challenging with our ROV dives, not challenging, but we don't always live dive, live feed our midwater. So we, we go down to depths of 4,000 meters, right? And that takes about three hours. And so there's three hours of lots of blue and blue and more blue and lots of blue. And then... A, all of a sudden you see these amazing creatures, whether it be a squid or a siphonophore that is created the most giant circle I've ever seen in the middle of the ocean. Can you talk a little bit about siphonophores and what they are for the people at home in a very yeah, general sense? <laughs> it's not really a group that I work on. Um, I don't work on pelagic organisms pretty much at all. 
Um, in these animals are, are colonial, um, they can become very, very large. I think the one that Deb, you were mentioning, um, it was, it's quite difficult to measure something floating in the water. You know, we have laser beams that are set about 10 centimetres apart, but you have to um, actually bounce them off something. And so when you're in blue water, that gets really difficult. So we, we did come across this very large one uh, coming up the other day, and we sort of slowly circled it and, and tried to get an understanding for how big it was. And I'm not sure that we have a, you know, a definite final calculation, but it certainly it was sort of spiraled and so mm. you know how you measure that is quite difficult but it was you know between 10 and 35 meters incredibly large it just looked like a flying carpet ufo kind of thing it was <laughs> very strange and very different to the animals that we normally work on on the sea floor awesome um so i'm sure that there will be more on that later so stay tuned when we you know, come late breaking news with more information as, as more um, people get involved with that. Um, Brian has a question. I know we've touched on some of this, Brian. Um, what do you do with the samples when you're finished? So if you go back a little ways in this video, um, they have explained that. Um, their question was sort of, do you dump the sediment in different locations? Does it all go back to land? Do some of the animals survive? So can you talk a little bit about sampling? I know that's always a concern of our viewers. Um, you know, why sampling is important, whether it's a small part of the sample or the whole organism. Why is that important to your research and to researchers that may um, use some of your data in the future? Yeah, so while the imagery that Sebastian collects is incredibly important, um, in science, having a physical specimen to link to research is also really important. Many details that we can't get from imagery alone, and these things um, may have to be uh, dissected under a microscope and compared in fine detail with other parts of the literature and other specimens around the world. So for some animals, we're able to take a, an image and just collect part of the animal and leave most of it there. In other times, with, with soft-bodied organisms, have to collect the whole thing. But it's important to remember too that the deep ocean is incredibly large and we are looking at a tiny, tiny part of it over just a few weeks. So um, it's not the same as collecting with a trawl. Each um, specimen is collected because it's needed um, and we're able to do that very carefully and, and take care of that specimen. When we describe species that are new, we do need a specimen. For each species, there's a single specimen in a jar in a museum somewhere in the world that is the, we call a type specimen. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a gold standard for that species. So if anyone is unclear about the identification of that species, they will request to see the holotype, that specimen. And so it's really important to have that specimen and have it in good condition so that future science can be connected with that identification. Absolutely. Amazing. Okay, guys, this is your last chance at home to speak with these scientists. Ask whatever remaining questions you have. We have about a five minutes or so left. So send in your questions. We will um, try to get them answered. And thank you again for joining us. This is the research vessel Falcor, Schmidt Ocean Institute, and we are live on YouTube and Facebook. You can watch our ROV dives every day. We live feed the ROV dives both to YouTube and Facebook. Unfortunately, today our dive was um, cut short. We had some camera issues on the vehicle, but they have been sorted now, so we should be back in the water tomorrow. Um, you can always check our website, Schmidt Ocean dot org and that will tell you whether we are live or not and give you a link to YouTube. Okay. Well, I have one more question for you guys then if nobody at home does. Oh, Here it comes guys. What have you found the most challenging about this expedition so far, first? And second, what have you then found the most rewarding? Um, I think the most challenging part of it has been, obviously, when we left, um, the global pandemic was just kind of yes. starting. And so we, um, you know, a collection of people 
pushed off in this ship. And the world has obviously changed quite a lot since then. So we were isolated and, and safe and healthy, but we understand that other people are, are facing a lot of challenges. They might be in isolation, they may be ill, um, and they may just be missing and certainly people on board are too. So having connections via the internet and, and phone and things like that are really important for, for living on board a ship, particularly in these kinds of times. But we've been actually really um, buoyed by the fact that uh, people Watching watch along feeds. with the live feeds mm. and, and people have mentioned it's really helping them cope. It's it's something interesting. It's, it's something else. And so we're happy to be able to find um, some positive spin a dark cloud, a dark cloud with a silver lining, and so I think um, many students are out of school now in the U.S. And hopefully, some of the live feeds can be used to supplement at-home learning um, and just bring some marine science to life for people that are in isolation right now. Really get to watch along. Same oh, moment that we do, and yeah, here. I <laughs> Very excited about it. <laughs> so let's go diving tomorrow. Come yeah, and join us. Good. Come and join us. <laughs> awesome. Um, on a last note, um, again, my father's coming up with these questions, I'd add. <laughs> How valuable is a ship like Falcor to your research? Oh, wow. Um, it's changed for me how we're able to do marine science. Uh, one of the most spectacular things that you often don't get to do is is see the animals you're collecting, but not just see the animal you're collecting in order to select it, but to actually watch how it behaves in situ, in life. You get this idea of um, information around behavior, ecology, that can kind of just develop that story of that animal that you may describe as a new species down the line. So I think that has just been unbelievable and team's ability to help you capture animals or um, problem solve with you uh, develop new tools on the fly has just been unbelievable so just the amount of support that Schmidt has provided with the RV Falkor and Sebastian and the people it's always the people too um, and just helped us focus on what we need to do the food is beautiful you know we're not um, things like making dinners and stuff um so yeah so yeah magic really opened up a whole part of the ocean that we weren't able to access before and what we're able to help us actually compare. you have all of the parts of the puzzle to put together you've only got a, a partial understanding an incredible window open for us and also, there are some of the colleagues we haven't seen for a while that have been on board. So new partnerships and new ideas form when you just bring different people together that don't often work together. And so that's been a wonderful uh, opportunity as well. Awesome. Um, let me see real quick and see if there's any more questions. We had a few come in. You guys are doing a great service to those of us stuck at home. So there's lots of thanks. Helping homeschooling. Thanks Yay. for the kind words. Um, uh, and you can always send your questions in during the live stream. There's a, a, an ability to to ask us right then and there what we're doing. Um, so please don't think this is your only opportunity. I really encourage you to get curious about what you're seeing. Yeah, we'd love to hear more children kind of ask some questions. Uh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, amazing. And you can always reach out on Facebook. We have a Facebook page, so send us a message. We'll try to get back to you as soon as we can. Also, this thread, you can reply to um, the video once it's posted up on YouTube, and we'll try to get back to some questions there if there's more questions. I think for now, we're going to say goodbye. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Nerida and Lisa, for a wonderful discussion about the Expedition Falkor. You can join us again on Saturday at the same time. We are going to be investigating our wet lab. So what is a wet lab? What happens in a wet lab? What kind of science goes on? What are the tools that you use? So please join us again on Saturday at 
10 a.m. local on the eastern side of the U.S., 7 a.m. It'll be 10 p.m. for us. It's now 10.30 at night, so I am going to let our co-chief scientists here go to bed so they can actually get up um, very early for our ROV dive in the morning. So I just want to say thank you both for joining us. Thank you, everybody at home, for joining us. And I hope that you have a lovely evening or morning or the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.